Hello, friends. I'm so pleased that you're joining us online today. And I just want to share with you that there is nothing better to preach about than loving God and loving Jesus. In fact, I just got so much out of the sermon last week. And if you haven't seen it, you can go to our watch on LegacyChurchGA.com and view last week's sermon because this sermon this week is a bit of a segue. So I just want to talk to you today a little bit today a little bit about loving Jesus. I want to tell you a story. Theologian and pastor Dr. Brian Chapel tells the story that happened in his hometown. Now it seems that two brothers were playing on the sandbanks by the river. One ran after another up a large mound of sand. But unfortunately the mound was not solid and their weight caused them to sink in quickly. When the boys did not return home for dinner, the family and neighbors organized a search. They actually found the younger brother unconscious with his head and shoulders sticking out above the sand. When they cleared the sand to his waist, he awakened. The searchers asked, where is your brother? The child replied, I'm standing on his shoulders. Now with the sacrifice of his own life, the older brother lifted the younger to safety. The tangible and sacrificial love of the older brother literally served as a foundation for the younger brother's life. In 1 John 3.16, the Apostle John says, We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. Jesus sacrificed his life for us because he loves us. How do we love him in return? Do you think that perhaps the younger brother that lived to tell the story loved his older brother like no other for giving him the gift of life? How much more would we love Jesus? today for giving up his life for us, that we might be set free. Last week, we explored the whys and hows of loving God, our Heavenly Father. We explored the dictionary's definition of love, which was a strong affection for another arising out of kinship or personal ties. We talked about how much God loves us and how he proved it to us. And we talked about ways we can tangibly show God our love. You know, all of that is good. But we also explored what I believe to be true. That you can actually have the mechanics of loving down to a science. But without an encounter with the love of Christ, an actual personal encounter, that love would only be an action or a duty. Now, the late author of the Ragamuffin Gospel, Brennan Manning, himself a Franciscan priest, said this, I learned what a wise old Franciscan told me the day I joined the order. Once you come to know the love of Jesus Christ, nothing else in the world will seem as beautiful or desirable. Well, let me illustrate a little further. Just like seeking to know God, our Heavenly Father, we must seek to know all about Jesus Christ. When we seek to know God the Father, we can love him, and we'll, it will help us know him better so we can love him better. The same is true with Jesus. So when our knowledge of him and his love for us combines with what the Holy Spirit will prompt us to do with Jesus and his love for us, we can understand how to love him. Now let me illustrate that further. When we experience Jesus Christ, our love is fueled by that experience instead of proving we love him out of duty. You see, we encounter Jesus by being born again. Now, this rebirth is kick-started by the Holy Spirit, the third person in the Godhead. The Holy Spirit convicts you of your sins and then convinces you of your need for forgiveness. So therefore, when you feel the Holy Spirit moving inside your heart, you will acknowledge your sins and then become truly sorry, seriously sorry for those sins. 
Then, confessing your sins to Jesus, you will ask him to forgive your sins and come into your heart, into your life. And when we ask for his forgiveness, he forgives and casts our sins away. And not only does he forgive and cast our sins away, he comes into your heart and you are completely changed. You are new, born again, different than ever before. You know, Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 5. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we, we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. This simply means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Once you've experienced Christ and your life is completely changed, you will have the ability to truly love him. Now, just because you say you love someone, you say it, it doesn't mean you actually do. That's especially true as it relates to our love for Jesus. You know, Jesus says some pretty important words to the religious leaders who were in their consistent habit of grilling Jesus, actually trying to find a reason to condemn him. They were in that habit. They were in that, that realm right about then. And so he spoke these somber words found in Matthew 15. Well, let me give you a snippet of those words. Jesus said, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. For he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. Now, let's look a moment at that last statement made by the prophet Isaiah and then quoted again by Jesus himself. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. So you might think you love Jesus, you might say you love Jesus, but do you really love Jesus? Your idea of loving Jesus, if not born out of a personal encounter with the greatest change agent known to humankind, might be a bit lacking. Why do we love Jesus? Because he gave his life for us and set us free from living our lives in sin. However, it goes even deeper than that. Being set free from our sin and given eternal life brings gratitude, a deep desire to show love to our deliverer, and changes our life. Let me give you a different illustration than, than the one I began with today. A kidney transplant, for instance. Let's say that I am very sick and need a new kidney. And Pastor Jeff desires to help me and show me the ultimate gift of love by sharing one of his kidneys with me. Now, I already love Pastor Jeff, and I tell him I love him and appreciate him. But do you think that perhaps I might love him in a new and different way because he literally saved my life with his gift? Now, let me take it a bit further. Ten years from now, I'm a healthy guy. I've got Jeff's healthy kidney working in me, and everything is working great. No rejections. I'm, I'm doing well. He's doing well with his kidney, only to find out that he has a disease. He has cancer, perhaps leukemia, and he has it, it's in his bones. And Jeff needs a bone marrow transplant. Now, sometimes a donor is hard to find, and, and I've been registered with the bone marrow transplant uh, database for many years, and by some amazing coincidence, I am a perfect match for Pastor Jeff. So I'm contacted by the transplant team, and they tell me that we have a guy that needs a bone marrow transplant. His name's Jeff Coleman, and you are a perfect match. 
well, I, I'm healthy. I can give a bone marrow transplant to Jeff, but I've heard that it's really painful. I've heard that it creates weakness. And, and sometimes there are some complications in rare situations. And so I'm thinking, I'm not sure I want to do it. What if I said no? Would that truly be showing love to Jeff? Would that truly be the deep love and deep, out of a deep gratitude, out of that experience of me having part of him inside of me that gave me life, and now I'm not willing to reciprocate that? You see, it's, it's, that, it's really like that with us and Jesus. Jesus has literally given us eternal life. The Bible says he has placed his spirit within us. And then we struggle with what might be involved in showing him complete love. Now, in this case, we have a classic example, classic example of taking from a sacrificial giver, the, the story I just shared about, at a very deep level, but then failing to give back with the same fervor. We might say we love that person, but are we willing to sacrifice ourselves to show that love? Jesus actually asks us for that kind of devotion. Because he saved us, he sacrificed his life. He asks us for that deep of a love. Now, what is that devotion? What does that love actually look like? Well, let's take a look at Jesus, who was in the upper room with his disciples on the night in which he was betrayed. And the reason why he came was soon to come to fruition. They didn't know all of the events that were to come, but... He told them many things. I want to look at one very important statement he made. It's found in John 14, 21. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. Think about that for just a moment. If you know his commandments, you read his commandments, and you know what he is asking for, and you obey them, it actually shows him love. Now, it's interesting that many of Jesus' commandments are, ex are, are experiential in nature. Not just, hey, you need to do this, this is a command, so go do that or do, or do this. Now, there are many of those. But being able to obey those commandments is certainly made possible because of other commandments that we are obeying. Where if we obeyed those commandments, those experiential commands, it would enable us to continue to experience Jesus and experience him loving us and we loving him. And John shares four of those. In John 1.12, Jesus tells us to receive him. In John 1.43, Jesus tells us to follow him. In John 14.11, Jesus tells us to believe in him. And in John 15.4, Jesus tells us to remain in him. John remembered those. He wrote those down. Because these commands are not based on fulfilling a list of duties or making sure we do the right thing or don't do the wrong thing. Don't get me wrong. We still need to obey the other commandments that save us from all kinds of grief. However, these four are incredible invitations to deepen our ongoing experiential life with him. Now, even though our love experience with Jesus was kick-started by being born again, our experience in our love relationship with him actually never ends. There are some realities, though, that we must be aware of as we seek to love Jesus. The first reality is Satan does not want us to love Jesus. He wants, to love our, he wants us to love ourselves. He wants to, us to love the world, the place where he has dominion. There's another thing that we must realize. Our love for Jesus is not natural. You know what is natural? Our love for ourselves. We are self-preservationists. We want to preserve ourselves and our happiness at all costs. 
Another fact is many of us would rather have a checklist than an experience. We'd like to say, okay, these are the things that I need to do. I need to go to church. I need to read my Bible. I need to pray. I need to do all of these things. But now to abide, to believe in, to experience Christ on a daily basis, to deepen my walk with him, I don't know. I'd rather just have a checklist. Just tell me what to do. I'll check those things off. And then that will show that I love Jesus because that's obeying his commands. But do you remain in him? Do you believe in him? Do you, do you dwell with him? Do you abide with him? Does he abide in you? And here's another really, 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 really quite a somber, somber fact. Loving Jesus experientially will require effort. Jesus said, Matthew 16, 24, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Well, let's hold on for just a moment on that one. If you want to follow Jesus, which is a requirement to show that you love him, you must give up your own way. Who wants to do that? I know that as I have walked with God for many years now, that when I go my own way, it's almost always disastrous. So he's not asking you to do something that will be harmful for you. He's asking you to do something that will make your life better. But nobody wants to give up their own way. I don't know anybody that just gets up in the morning and says, you know what, I don't want to do my own thing today. I want to do everything according to the word of God. Wow, what would our life be like if we actually did that? But then Jesus goes on to say this, not only must you give up your own way, you've got to take up your cross. Well, that cross is to obey God's commands. Those, that, that cross is to obey the word. That cross is to put Jesus first in every situation, no matter what. And then he says, then you can follow me. You see, while abiding in Jesus, if we have sin in us, that's a miserable existence. Let me repeat that again. While abiding in Jesus, having sin in us is miserable. You see, if we've been born again and we're a new creation, we're no longer enslaved to sin. We have a new master. God is our master. Sin is no longer our master. When we allow sin to remain in us, we are going to be a miserable people. I've always maintained that it's more miserable to know Christ and have him in our life and have the Holy Spirit dwelling in our life and have sin than to be sinners before we accept Christ. We don't know how miserable we really are, but you want to know real misery? It's allowing sin to exist inside of you when your sin nature, your natural person, is at war with the Holy Spirit. Here's another fact. When we're following Jesus, we may not want to go where he leads. He may say, I want you to do this. I want you to act this way. I want you to love unconditionally. I want you to go here or go there with your life. And we, we may not want to. But when we do, we show him we love him. Here's a little bit more for you to digest. When we believe in him, there will be others who will try to influence us with other philosophies. Philosophies about living life. And those things will not be found in God's word. And if we follow those ways, we will be out of sync with God. And we, we don't show him that we love him. We show our Savior that what he did for us really was not that big of a deal. Because we're still willing to listen to other things, other philosophies. Another one is when we're remaining in him, we will have to patiently trust him in everything. That's probably one of the most difficult things. We want what we want and we want it now. So we pray and we ask God and we expect him to give us those desires because he said he'd give us the desires of our heart. But he might be saying, I want you to wait. I have something better for you. I have something that will make your life even better. And then to love Jesus means you will desire him more than anything else the world has to offer. My friends, who do you desire today? Who do you desire? Jesus loves us despite who and what we are. 
We love him because of who and what he is. We love him because he is God. He was God incarnate. And what he is, when you ask him to forgive your sins and come into your life, he is your savior. And you get the opportunity to make him Lord. All these things are possible because when we love him, when we focus on him, when we spend time in his word, and when we communicate with him through prayer, he will strengthen us and he will enable us to experience his love and love him in return. Let me ask you this today. Do you desire to experience the love of Jesus? Make it your greatest aim. Make it your greatest aim and get ready to be delighted. Psalm 37, 4 says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. My friends, I want, I want to just encourage you, love Jesus with all your heart. Love him because he is your savior. He is your friend. And he serves you by giving his life. If you don't know Jesus Christ today, I ask you to listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling you that, hey, you've got some sins that you need to get forgiven. Hey, you've got some sins that you need to repent of. And Jesus is waiting, willing and able to forgive those sins. Ask him to forgive your sins today and ask him to come into your life and then plan on abiding in him and allowing him to abide in you. You'll find that loving Jesus brings a great reward of life, health, and peace. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the day. Thank you, Lord, for the word. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ. God the Father, thank you for your love that you demonstrated to us. In that while we were still sinners, you sent Jesus to die for us. Just like the little story, the little true story that, that I told at the beginning of the message today that a older, an older brother gave his life to save his younger brother. How that younger brother must have loved that older brother for that sacrifice. How much could we love Jesus today? How much should we love Jesus? Because he saved our lives and gives us eternity. God, we love you. We love Jesus. Help us to love him more. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful day.